It's fantastic to be in a room of a whole lot of people who are living and breathing seaweed because it can sometimes seem a little bit lonely out there at places like the uh, Aquaculture Conference. I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, the uh, Gary Hooper, Dave Taylor and the uh, Aquaculture New Zealand team for the, for the great conference over the last couple of days to, to our many partners that are here. Uh, we have Blair and the team from Ocean Beach. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we've got a couple of uh, NIWA people here. I saw Neil before, but, uh, but Rob and all the science team at, uh, at NIWA who have been uh, great collaborators with us. Uh, Chris Hepburn and his team at Otago University. Uh, Bruce and Rebecca. Uh, you've heard from Rebecca already and the Aquaculture Direct team that are supporting us. Uh, Gary and the Mac Lab team uh, here in Nelson, uh, partners of ours, and of course uh, our seaweed farmers. Uh, who are here as well today, Simon Pooley working with us, John O'Large, and, uh, and hopefully before too long, Lucas and his team in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, I also wanted to just shout out to uh, Matt Bartholomew who's joining us. Uh, look, we, we talked today about a lot of challenges we have with legislation and the MPI, but I just want to tell you Matt is a huge supporter uh, for the industry and for seaweed. I know that uh, through him and his team, you know, we can get things done. So. Uh, really appreciate you being here, Matt. Finally, uh, we've had funding support from SIL and from SFFF as well, which are a part of our journey. Um, CH4 Global. So uh, as Claire said, uh, we are on, well, she didn't say this, but I will paraphrase it as we are on a mission to save the world uh, by impacting climate change with urgency. And I guess uh, urgency comes through in terms of our ability to piss everybody off uh, at the speed we want to make things happen. Um, I thought I'd start with just our ambition for 2030. Uh, we have a detailed business plan which is going to see us uh, have a business that has uh, delivered $360 million worth of revenue in 2030. Uh, if you like, that's about uh, a little bit bigger than the salmon industry today, a little bit bigger than the mussel industry today. Um, and I just point that out, and you would say, well, you know, it's ambitious. But I just point that out to say that, that you know, this will underpin uh, a significant seaweed industry. So it's, uh, it's just saying we're not here just to, to talk about something that we like. Uh, this is something that is real and I believe is going to happen. That will allow us in New Zealand to, uh, to deliver solutions for one million dairy cows here and, uh, and to reduce the uh, dairy methane emissions by 10% by 2030 uh, towards a reduction of 47% by 2035. The way we're going to do that, and essentially what we are about uh, is, uh, and what we are, what's really driving us is this climate tipping point. So this view, and, uh, and Minister Shaw reiterated this view at our opening in Bream Bay of our, of our facilities on, uh, on the Niwa campus on Tuesday, uh, to quote his words, we are nine years away from a tipping point, that point at which uh, climate change has got to 1.5 degrees and is irreversible. Now the, uh, we, the world and most countries don't get to a carbon neutral position until 2050, so we've got uh, a gap of about 15 years uh, if we want to avoid that tipping point. And methane, reductions in methane in the short term are really the only way that we can push out that tipping point. And that's where uh, methane emissions in cattle come into play. There's 1.5 billion cattle on the planet and together uh, they uh, basically are responsible for uh, emission, uh, emissions in, in carbon, CO2 equivalent terms that are greater than ch all of China's emissions. Uh, it would be, it would, we, we believe it would cost about a trillion dollars to address those emissions across all of those cows which is really a drop in the ocean compared to any other way we have for addressing the short-term climate change tipping point. Our own corporate ambition is that uh, globally we will achieve a one gigaton reduction in global emissions by 2030 and we believe that alone will be sufficient to push out that tipping point by one to two years. How we're going to do that is this thing called asparagopsis, uh, a very tricky 
difficult, unresearched seaweed, uh, which has was found through CSIRO uh, to be uh, a seaweed that had these unique qualities of being able to reduce methane when consumed by ruminant animals. Uh, essentially, they found this was effect, then effect, they then screened uh, seaweeds globally uh, against uh, this factor that they uh, believe was driving uh, that benefit being the amount of bromoform in the seaweed and found that asparagopsis had by far uh, the highest level of, uh, of bromoform in the seaweed than any other seaweed on the planet. And so that focused in on a set of uh, research and animal trials across uh, feedlot cattle, across grazing cattle, across sheep and across dairy uh, looking at the, uh, the impact and reductions from feeding asparagopsis uh, to those animals. And essentially, the, the, uh, in most of those, or the, on average across those, we were looking at, a, they saw about an 80% reduction in methane emissions. It just so happens that seaweed is native to New Zealand and to South Australia, and so this was a really good place to start an organisation that was about exploiting this IP uh, from the IP owner FutureFeed, and uh, New Zealand are the only license, uh, CH4 Global are the only licensee in New Zealand of this technology today. Uh, I was just also going to say that is the life cycle of, uh, of this, this plant. It was thought to be two completely different seaweeds uh, at one stage, and, uh, and the, um, the plant-like product that you see on your left uh, is essentially growing in the sea uh, with a leafy structure, but like asparag asparagus, uh, versus at the bottom there, the pom-pom or filament structure, which is uh, a completely different part of the life cycle that we grow on land. And it turns out that one at the bottom is an awful lot easier, simpler uh, to control and manage than the, uh, the sea-based version. Now, over the last two years, our focus has been on science R&D. Uh, we have closed the life cycle of, uh, of that, that whole life cycle that is there. We have uh, found the triggers for sporulation so that we can basically produce spores and, uh, and then settle those onto uh, seeded lines. We've developed the technology to do that. And in the process, we've also uh, been developing the technology to optimise the production of biomass. Uh, and that was mainly being driven by uh, the support for our hatchery and nursery operations. But as we went through that process, we realised that uh, we could get a, a level of efficiency in that biomass production that meant that the techno-economics of growing the seaweed on land were getting very close to uh, the economics of growing it in the sea. But as we've heard already today, the sea is a very difficult, changeable environment uh, to do anything in. And I thought Breen put it really nicely. I, I, the quote I will get wrong, but it was something like, you know, growing your product in something that changes 100 times a day and, uh, and where your soil or seawater the next day is completely different to what you had the day before. Uh, we can control all of these variables, obviously, in a land-based system. And so we've pivoted, uh, at least in the short term, to, uh, to a scale-up plan based on land-based production. On Tuesday, uh, we officially opened our own facility at, uh, at Niwa, nearly made it onto their flyover video of their massive kingfish farm, which is right next door, but they didn't. They cut it just before we got there. Um, the, in there, we have a hatchery, a nursery. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 30 tanks of different sizes, including uh, eight uh, large bioreactors, essentially a pilot uh, uh, tank farm. We've also got uh, nursery buildings, and we've developed specialised chemistry, biology, and uh, culture chamber labs in that facility. Uh, we've been supported through that by, by SIL and, uh, and now with, uh, we've got a, a SFFF grant of uh, $900,000 towards a $3 million uh, project of uh, essentially piloting uh, all of our marine farming operations. 
So uh, we are carrying on with our marine farming operations. We had sized that facility uh, at Niwa to support seeded lines, enabling us to grow at 200 hectares of new water space per year. But in the short term, we are using that biomass for commercial production. We have, uh, we have acquired uh, eight sites, or at least eight sites, in the top of the south here. We've got four of those sites right now with seaweed, um, and we're, we're, we're planning to extend that to the other four sites. Uh, we've got two sites consented uh, in the Hareki Gulf, uh, and we're in discussions about leasing those right now, and we are waiting for consents on another 10 sites in the Hareki Gulf. Uh, to come through, which we would expect to have in the next couple of months. Um, that pilot tank farm uh, in Niwa is, uh, is at the point where uh, by the end of November we'll be producing half a tonne of, uh, of, of wet seaweed per month. In terms of where we go next, uh, we announced last month, uh, and uh, very grateful for the Southland Times to pick it up, putting it on their front page, uh, that we are investing in our first of what we're calling an echo park. It's essentially a large scale land based production facility, about 500 tanks, uh, producing about five tonnes of seaweed per day. Uh, and each one of these echo parks will ultimately be able to support about 50,000 cattle in terms of bringing down those emissions uh, by about 80%. Uh, the first phase starts, the build starts on Monday. Uh, all the tanks and all the equipment are on site and ready to go. Of the first phase of 20 tanks, which is essentially a, a pilot operation that will just allow us to, uh, to test some of the processes and the automation. Uh, on uh, essentially April, we will kick off the, uh, the planning for the full echo park of those 500 tanks, which we expect to be uh, in production by the end of next year. Now to meet an ambitious goal of that $360 million worth of revenue a year by 2030, we will have to install one of those echo parks every six months. And uh, we're going to get the first one wrong uh, because we are moving with uh, a level of urgency which means we haven't got time to really pilot and get everything we need to know before we put the next first one in. Uh, I think hopefully by the time we put the third one in, and now $10 million a pop, um, we'll be starting to get it something close to, uh, to working properly. But when you're working with urgency and with speed, you're not going to get everything right. So that was just a quick run through of, uh, of, uh, of CH4. I wanted to point out that we're we're driven by three core tenants. So one I've talked to already, uh, we're about acting with urgency. So as an organisation, we are focused on that climate tipping point. I know that aquaculture generally is a very patient industry. Good things take time. Uh, and, uh, and the mussel industry told me that uh, after 40 years, they're close to working out how to make mussels work well. But um, we are approaching this with a different mindset. Uh, in terms of the speed with which we want to make this happen. And, uh, and we're working with partners who understand and support that mindset, which has been great. Our second tenant is support farmers. So we firmly believe that this should not cost New Zealand farmers uh, anything at all. They should not have to bear the cost of, uh, of uh, working with us to save the world. So we're looking with solutions whereby through carbon credits, through process of premiums, uh, the, uh, the cost won't ultimately fall on our, uh, our land-based farmers. And similarly, we're working with marine farmers to say we will cover the costs of, uh, of developing the technology and, uh, and farming whatever needs to, whatever we can, we can achieve in a marine farming environment. So again, it's it's supporting and developing uh, marine farmers. It's supporting and, uh, and providing ongoing livelihood for land-based farmers. And finally, it's a very core part of our uh, tenant to support First Nations. So from a New Zealand point of view, it's about partnering with the Tangata Whenua, 
wherever we're operating. So we are looking to, uh, to develop uh, a very close relationship with Harakiki, the, uh, the local hapu on the uh, Niwa site, uh, with uh, Aroa um, Rinranga at Bluff, uh, and, and basically working with them to, to bring in and employ uh, their iwi hapu whānau members uh, into, uh, into our sites, and we'll be looking over time also to, to look for opportunities for, for them to co-invest in what we're doing in terms of those echo parks to make it a, a true partnership uh, with Tangata Whenua. So that's, uh, that's us. You can find out more about us at ch4global.com. I'm here with, uh, with Javed Khan and, uh, and Robert Stack. You can also talk to Michael Lakeman, our VP Biology, who's, who's led our science. We'd be, we'd be only too happy to talk to you about uh, our ambition and what we're doing. And, uh, and as I said, it's fantastic to be in a room full of, uh, of seaweed enthusiasts and advocates and uh, look forward to your support.